awesome. Awesome. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, cool. All's good. Sorry about that. So, you know, technical difficulties, but we're we making it work. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I want to just tell everybody a little bit about you. Um, so Kareem has, is the founder and CEO of Fourth Movement, which is a social equity firm that is incubating cannabis companies. Um, it's, I'll let him tell you about you know, everything, but he is an, a serial entrepreneur coming from um, the retail space himself. So he really understands customer service as well. And he understands the importance of um, making sure that we can build wealth as African-Americans within our community through entrepreneurship. And um, the cannabis industry is no different. So we're here to continue on the social equity conversation. And Kareem, I'll let you take it away and I'll come back in to um, go over the Q&A when it's time. All right, perfect. Well, thank you, Hope. No problem. Cool. Well, um, and thanks for everybody that's that, that's that's logged in and watching today. I think um, first, I just want to say that I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to each and every one of you all um, today, because I want to encourage all of us to embrace a paradigm shift with respect to how we view and advocate for social equity or set aside licensing and those programs and that policy in the United States. Because I know that if we get this right, we collectively can be the catalyst to black people existing equitably in our country. Um, like Hope said, I'm the CEO of Fourth Movement. And um, so from, for context, we vet, train, finance, and partner with individuals uh, from communities who've been heavily impacted by the disproportionate impact of criminal justice to own and operate competitive retail businesses in our industry, it's, it's dispensaries. And then our model provides for the resources necessary to stand up um, what we hope to be some of the most competitive in the space. Uh, prior to launching Fourth Movement and still, I'm a franchisee of Buffalo Wild Wings um, based in, in and around Southern California, and we've got several units. Um, so I think for this conversation, you know, and, and, and I designed it to be about 25 minutes so we could use the balance of the time that really being Q&A. Um, what we'll explore is what are the outcomes that we should be seeking and then how do we make that happen? Uh, but before I get into it, uh, I want to, in addition to the keynote, I want to acknowledge Hope and her team for not only creating this platform, but for demonstrating her entrepreneurial tenacity in this time uh, and finding a way to continue to make this conference happen and to do it digitally. I think it's uh, incredible and an amazing platform. So thank you, Hope. And um, I got to shout out to dynamic women who I know are um, we're all hearing from, if not today, tomorrow. Um, Angela Rye and Shanita Penny, with whom I work with both closely. So and all of you all that are tuning in and supporting the effort. Um, when we talk about social equity, uh, th the first question that comes to mind for me is like, what is the outcome that we seek, right? Um, when you're gonna endeavor into anything, we gotta ask the question, why? Like, what are we trying to accomplish here? Um, and so let's leverage the word equity when we talk about social equity and what does equity look like? What does it look like in America? To me, um, anything that we ask for or that we endeavor to create, we have to measure. Um, so, and we got to know what we're measuring at the beginning to, to determine whether or not we were successful um, and what we rolled out. And so from an equity perspective, I think three measurables that, that, that we can look to to see whether or not we exist equitably in this country are health outcomes, educational attainment, and household income or net worth, right? So as we are like looking into the facts that we could bring you today, I said, well, being a person of color in America is bad for your health. That's according to David Chan of the Harvard School of Public Health. So according to Chan, he says, there is no single solution to the societal racism and poverty that contribute to poor health. Um, but he says, quote, we now know enough to improve the situation. Health builds from where we live, learn, work, and play, only secondarily in the doctor's office. So I'd argue that health builds from the quality of the environment in which we live, learn, work, and play. 
uh, because we know that some of the same communities that we live in in the places that we have lived in have experienced um, and have experienced negative health, health outcomes are being transformed or gentrified. So when people with higher incomes, educational attainment and accumulated resources inhabit those same, same areas, health outcomes improve. So it's not um, where you are, it's what you have, what you've been exposed to and what you're prepared to do that determines health outcomes. With respect to education, let's just look at where we were at the end of 2018, which was the last year I could get the stats, right? So 71% of high school seniors graduated high school um, in 2018, 78% for white students, 56% for African-American students, 54% for Latino students. And in four-year institutions, 62% of white and Asian students who enrolled were enrolled finished their four-year college degrees, 48% for African-Americans and Latinos. Then with respect to net worth, you know, we, we know where we're headed here. It's not good. The average black household has a net worth of $35,000. The average white household has a net worth of $150,000. So, you know, it would require an entirely different keynote to effectively list the ways that these inequitable outcomes really impact our quality of life and our ability to exist equitably. Uh, so to me, this is what we've got to fix. And my question is, what if we use social equity policy as the catalyst to change it? What if we make those outcomes the ultimate goal? What would the policy look like, right? Um, what questions would need to be asked and answered? Who would qualify? What should be required? and how should we measure? So I'm gonna take a crack at telling you my answers to those questions. I'm gonna wrap that up and then I'm gonna engage you guys in, in uh, a conversation about it. Um, so in LA and Los Angeles, um, you know, social equity has been um, on the table for now two years, um, legitimately two years and change. And uh, we haven't seen our first social equity license, social equity dispensary open yet. The city of LA issued um, 100, what they're calling invoices that will um, potentially soon be temporary licenses, which will allow folks to apply for state licenses and begin to get open. Uh, the policy in general uh, failed. I think it failed to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish in terms of who got the opportunity in the first 100. And I believe that they're gonna fix that with respect to the next round of social equity licenses. What we can applaud is that, at least in the city of LA, our policymakers um, made certain that two thirds of the total opportunity, which is gonna be a little bit more than 400 licenses, um, end up going to people from communities that have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis arrest. I think that's a good thing. Um, I think a policy that would um, effectively impact um, our outcomes would look something more like at least 80% of all of the licenses in any jurisdiction should be quote unquote social equity licenses. Um, I think in order to have the biggest impact with families and community, um, we ought to have an income ceiling on those that qualify for the policy, for, for the set aside license, social equity license. There are obviously ought to be a, a residency requirement and a pretty strict one. And I think that these um, licenses uh, um, should be set aside and awarded to people based uh, upon merit, based upon people's ability to leverage that license the best way possible. What we understand about these uh, set aside licenses, which is what social equity licenses are, they're set aside, um, is that there is a finite number of them. So no matter what jurisdiction you're in, by and large, um, there's a certain number that are gonna be issued. In Illinois, I think it's 74 or 75. Um, you know, in Oakland, this last round was, I think, uh, two to four. Uh, in San, San Francisco, there's a finite amount. The policy that they were talking about in New York and in New Jersey, it was not gonna be open licensing. There's gonna be a finite amount of licenses. 
as policy is being considered around the country. Um, so if we are trying to impact our outcomes, then we ought to be looking for um, the folks that qualify for these licenses and their applications. We should be measuring which individual and their idea around how to uh, execute against a license, how to maximize it, is going to have the biggest impact on our outcomes as a community. And that should be um, really how we design uh, the, the judgment of the applications. Um, I think the policy always has to be transparent um, in the application process and in the scoring. And then I think there ought to be a diverse, from a experience perspective, group of people who score the applications. For instance, you need someone who's, um, or a few people um, who are, are seasoned um, business people, for sure. You need people who are community um, engaged advocates who um, are going to only um, or whose main concern is going to be focusing on the right people from the right communities who have the right heart and the right intention with the license get licensed. I think you need some people that represent the policymaker and the interest of, um, um, you know, all of the citizens in the jurisdiction, not just the people who um, qualify. Um, I think you need some educators. Um, for instance, in LA, I would think that you would have somebody like um, uh, Professor Tyrone, I think his last name is Freeman at UCLA, he runs the Black Male Institute. Um, or there are uh, um, schools of social justice or social enterprise at universities. You want people who um, have experience and have studied policy that's worked around the world to bring that um, level of scrutiny information um, to the table as you're vetting um, who has the best ideas with respect to these licenses. Um, and then I think you want a framework that allows several models. You know, I've had, I've heard and talked to people who embrace a co-op model. I think that's viable. Um, obviously, there are folks like Hope and others who uh, began with one single unit and are single unit operators and outstanding at it. And I think that needs to, uh, we need to embrace that. I think there are folks who aren't who are quality, um, amazing individuals who will have the opportunity to 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 crush it as entrepreneurs who need access to capital, and um, and other access to other skill sets um, in order to operate at the highest level of the game. And those multi-unit partnership models ought to be um, allowed as well. And then we got to ask, like, okay, what questions? Uh, would you need would need to be asked and answered, right? Like, who is the applicant? What's the behavior of this human being? This human being is going to get one of a few finite um, opportunities. And I think to be clear, like social equity is is not a license. Like, it is only the license is really a license to have a distressed asset, unless you are the individual that has the ability to access all of the resources necessary to activate that license to its greatest and highest use. And that's what's in all of our interest in our community's interest. Can, so we, we, can yeah. I ask you a question about that? Sure. Yeah. So how do you think, okay, oh, well, I'll turn back. What do you think about Illinois first? What do you think about what Illinois has done, how they're trying to bring an element of social equity through offering craft grow licenses and giving preference through points? to their application process. Do you think that's a viable way to uh, implement social equity? And is it something that other states should follow suit? Um, yes and no. Like, so I think that part of it is viable, but it, is it going to lead to African-American people, um, you know, being able to compete at the largest scale? Right. No, not with a craft grow. When you're really, when you look at the amount of, um, of inventory, or biomass that you're able to create in that amount of square footage mm -hmm. um, of a grow, it doesn't lend, lead to you really being competitive in the space, mm -hmm. right? So um, yes, it's an entry level. It's like, to me, it's like asking somebody, should we allow food trucks? Yeah, we should allow food trucks and people to have food trucks. 
but why can't black people like, you know, have the cheesecake factories too, right? right? Or, and, or whatever else is out there. That's what I think about that. And then, you know, in business in general, right? In our industry, we know about the MSOs and who got all the medical licenses first, et cetera, Mm -hmm. et cetera. And, um, um, and who really had the political capital yeah. and the financial capital to ensure that there were loopholes in policy, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, you, you've got um, in Illinois, right? You've got in Illinois, you've got, you know, people who don't come from our community who haven't experienced or lived in communities that experienced this disproportionate, um, you know, uh, policing, et cetera, et cetera, as mm-hmm. a relationship cannabis and the war on drugs who qualify white people because they saying that they're they will hire somebody and who knows how finite or temporary that might be mm-hmm. who is a felon et cetera et cetera therefore they qualify for social equity well that's a, just a loophole that to me shouldn't exist right. right or other companies that qualify for social equity based upon who you hire i think social equity's got to be about ownership yeah right like there could be community benefit and hiring can be part of community benefit, but that's not part of the licensing. That should be part of the requirement for the licenses, right. not a loophole that allows you to, to 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 get in with people where these set aside licenses should be set as uh, should be set aside for us to be able to leverage them to improve our outcomes. Definitely, I yeah. I also always say that you know I I think from the legislative side, a hundred percent, I agree. It has to be about ownership. Um, and then we also have to talk about reinvesting directly back into the communities because not everybody wants to actually own a license. And then the yeah. people who win the licenses need to be held accountable, whether they be black, brown, yellow, white, do anything. You know, we need to orange <laughs> because that's a thing now, too, I guess. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think we need to hold each other accountable for that. But I also wanted to ask you about your experience. So before cannabis. Um, when you were building your franchise business, um, when you were Buffalo Wild Wings, right? So when you were building that, what was the entry like there? Did you experience some of the same barriers there? Yeah, well, for sure. I mean, like, um, you know, because you're, 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 you're a retail operator, the first thing that you do if you didn't buy your building, if you leased it, is you get a, a letter of intent. It's called right. an LY. Right. So we went through 21 LOIs before wow. we were able to actually get a lease signed. And that wasn't yeah. even a cannabis business. No, that was being in our early 30s and African-American yeah. with a medallion or a, a franchise agreement from a national franchise organization and still landlords that didn't want to deal with us. And we had the credit and the money and all of that stuff to. Um, wow be able to qualify and and we would get down the road and as soon as we showed up or people realized we were african-american somehow our deals would go away Mm -hmm. so you know no matter what industry you're in if you're african-american you can expect that you're gonna have to you know um you know run uphill run farther do whatever you know jump higher et cetera et cetera in order to be at an even playing field right yeah exactly yeah, I mean, I definitely experienced the same. We actually ended up having to purchase a building when that wasn't our original uh, plan at all. It wasn't in the strategy, wasn't in the budget, um, none of those things. But we had to make it happen because, you know, when you have a license, it's just so, you know, it's it's unique to even be able to, to have one. Mm-hmm. Um, as an African-American, you can't let it fail because of, of something small, like you can't negotiate a lease with anyone. I remember one place that we went to to go lease, um, it was about 1,500 square feet. And I think they were going to charge us around 11,000 a month. Um, You know, you just automatically get that green tax on it. So it's like when you're, I mean, that's already around the industry. And then to add on top of that being um, an African-American and then for me being, you know, I'm I'm under 30, I'm a, a woman. Um, and I'm black. So all the intersectionality of all these different things going on have, have definitely made it difficult, but not impossible. And, you know, we, you and I both are, are clearing the path for other people to be able to do the same. What yeah, the most, like, specific programs um, are fourth movement. What are you guys working on now? We're, we're focused on LA, right? Yeah. So we were successful with 13 out of the hundred and um, awesome. Our philosophy is, you know, 
kind of um, the reverse of what we've seen in our community and people in, in terms of people taking yeah. advantage of our community. So we've seen people that own like liquor stores and other things come to LA, you know, come into South LA, et cetera, make yeah. money owning those businesses and then go to other parts of town and, and reinvest in them. Right. What we decided was where is, um, where is the most traffic and the most um, disposable income in and around LA? Mm -hmm. You had to have leases in order to apply in Los Angeles. So mm -hmm. um, we acquired 32 leases. We applied. We were successful with 13 of them. But they mm -hmm. are they are in the you know kind of most affluent, best retail locations in and around LA. So our partners, our social mm -hmm. equity partners, who are all from South LA, uh, will be operating in those places and we'll be encouraging them and working with them, hopefully, to reinvest in and around South LA, which is the deal. That is so awesome. I mean. So you're really you're doing the work. You're you know boots on the ground. You are really you're actually educating these applicants that you had go through your program. You're educating them on how to run a business, and you'll be there to support them all the way through, right? Yeah, we're doing like PNL training now. I mean, we start with with um, I'll tell you what I learned from being a Buffalo Wild Wings franchisee, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's an entry level employer. Right. And right. so um, the folks and these are multi-million dollar businesses and all of them are operated by people who started as a server or started as as, um, you know, a cook, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, and are now, you know, running multi-million dollar businesses. We, we have the ability to do that mm -hmm. right? in some way, shape or form. Um, you know, you were born into a situation and through your own volition, um, we're able to get to Spelman. But if you were born into a different situation or somehow, some way, there were a different set of circumstances, that opportunity would have been presented for you like it was for me to go to Morehouse. Right. So. Right. Um, um, but by the grace of God, you know, we have the tools yeah. necessary for you to be where you are, for, for, for me to have the experiences that I have. Mm -hmm. It is up to us to be able to help other people. Um, be and then experience what we're experiencing so that they can go out and do right that's how right. we improve our outcomes um so yeah I, they're they're fully totally engaged and we start with this kind of um i call it i don't think you can be black and not have experienced trauma yeah i think all of us have got to address the fact that we've experienced institutional racism is traumatic yeah. So we got to start from there and we have to get to a baseline where we say um, we are not going to behave consistent with how we feel. We're going to behave consistent with how we're what we're committed to. Mm -hmm. And so um, and then we enter into a merit based training process. And, um, you know, and we had like our a team of people that were responsible for training, trained 120 people. Wow. And we're able to apply on behalf of um, 32. And in Illinois, we trained 60 people and we applied mm -hmm. on behalf of 30. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah. Um, when these people are licensed, will they be operating under the Fourth Movement brand or will they be operating under their own brands? Yeah. So it's it's a partnership model. Right. So okay. it's like one of the things that we know, like, for instance, if you were in a co-op or the other social equity or licensed um folks in and around um, dc metro right? right or in dc given state lines and all of that kind of stuff if you guys came together and said look we're gonna buy collectively you might be able to buy less expensively right right and reduce your cost of sales mm -hmm. or if you were gonna buy you know digital or um, any of the assets that you need to market and you bought mm -hmm. collectively you could buy more of it you would be able to um you know, leverage the scale in order to get better pricing, thereby improve your yeah. your profitability. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. So we have one brand called 64 and Hope, Prop mm -hmm. 64 legalized cannabis in, in California. And we will all, you know, all of our partners will operate under that brand, but they operate their own business and then we support them with services. Awesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's a great model. Um, I know earlier there was a, a retail panel um, and we had some dispensary owners on there and they, you know, everyone has aspirations to to brand their their companies and go all over, um, you know, and, and even I have thought about how I want to continue on the Mary Main brand. But for me, um, it's more about 
helping people get in any way that I can. Um, I partnered with some people in Illinois as well on applications that will operate under their own brands. Um, but yeah, I think that is awesome what you're doing. Uh, and I, I think it's really important to highlight that you're teaching very tangible skills. Um, you're not just kind of, it's not just mindset work. I think there's a lot of that in the cannabis industry, trying to get your mind right for it and just being aware of laws and all that stuff. But there's not a lot of people teaching those tangible steps to actually get through the application process. And then once you do, how to actually operate your business. Because yeah. a lot of people I, actually fail at that part. How do you do the schedule? How do you manage labor? How do you manage the cost of sales? How do you deal with all of the, the um, you know, uh, regulation with respect yeah. to policy and making sure you can maintain your license, right? Mm -hmm. Because it can be something small. And I don't think people realize how small a, a violation could be that could put your license in jeopardy. Yeah. yeah. You know, I've, he I've heard of people, something as small as in a cultivation center, having um, a cup where it's not supposed to be. Literally having a cup full of water where it's not supposed to be and that being a fine. And well, and you have to know that the Department of Cannabis Regulation or whomever else is more than likely not going to be people who are going to give us the benefit of the doubt. We could never yeah. expect the benefit of the doubt, right? So never, definitely. Well, anyone that has any questions for Kareem or myself, definitely um, put it in the chat right now. But we're going to keep chatting. Just want to definitely encourage you guys to ask us some questions about social equity, about Kareem's background. Um, definitely let us know what you're thinking. But um, Kareem, I want to know a little bit about, you know, what has been your favorite uh, thing since you got into the cannabis industry? It's been about two years for you now? Yeah, uh, two and a half. Um, yeah. You know, it's the days where we culminate, like, the trainings. Yeah. Right? So, like, you know, it's, it's you know, um, we've experienced so much pain as a people that when you begin to talk about the possibility, not like here's the license, it's like here's a possibility, right? And you get through some sort of milestone with respect to the training. Yeah. You really hear how people have been impacted by what mothers whose husbands have been in prison, mm -hmm. mothers themselves who've been involved in, in certain activity in order to provide for their families, sons that have been mm -hmm. away, fathers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and people who are seeing um, like light at the end of the rainbow. And, you know, typically when we meet folks and you start talking about um, what's possible, arms are crossed and they're like, yeah, yeah. whatever. Uh, and, but when they get open and the light goes off and people realize with or without this opportunity, they can create whatever they want for themselves in their life. Mm -hmm. That's when, I mean, like that's the goal. Not with yeah. we're pre we're pre revenue, right? So we're hoping we get our first store open in September, and so I mean that'll be another milestone. We've been waiting for two and a half years for that, right? But notwithstanding, like getting open and being operational and actually seeing people make money, yeah, right, and doing it. That part is exciting. So, I'm yeah, just I just yeah, when, yeah. <laughs> when you turn that road, you're like, oh, yeah. Then you have to pay a bill, and then it gets less exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all too familiar. Right. Wait till I'm you get sure sued. You know. Have you been sued yet? Wait till you get a slip and fall. Right? Yeah. Not yet. Right. I know. Mm -hmm. I know. We, we're hoping to avoid that for as long as humanly possible, but I know it's inevitable at some point, right? Without a doubt. Definitely. Yeah. Um, have you had anyone? So I know you said that not everyone who goes through your program um, is is going to get a license and get open and all that. But have you had anybody kind of transition their skills to the ancillary side? Do you guys talk about that at all in your training? Yeah, we place people. So we've got vendors who are are anticipating like being vendors for us mm -hmm. in agreements. And then, you know, and some of those are, are majority companies, not minority companies That's who awesome. are also looking for to diversify and don't, you know, don't have the cultural competency to really yeah. onboard or find, you know, the excuse what you hear. We can't find, you know, well, we have, you know, amazing individuals who've gone through training that we've vetted in terms of their character and so on and so forth. So we've had the opportunity to place people. Yeah, yeah. that's so awesome. So you're really creating this network and this ecosystem actually that can support itself. 
um, as you expand in other states and as different things go, I know you're focusing on LA, but I would assume, and then, well, you have Chicago potentially coming. Well, I'm assuming Chicago. Did you apply in any other areas besides Chicago? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, of the 30, I want to say like 24 of them were in, in and around Chicago. So, okay. yeah. yeah, you're hoping for that. So we'll find out about those licenses May 1st, right? They no. issued something yesterday. I mean, last week that said they're pushing back to June. But you've been in this business and I have long enough to know, like, I'm not betting on anything before the end um, of the year. Yeah. Right. I want to say September. You never know. I mean, Maryland was, was really great with it the first time I applied. So we applied in wow. November 2015 and we got notified of our approval December of 2016. So a full year. Yeah, there you go. So yeah. and it was supposed to be three months. I think. Yeah, exactly. I think the number of people that applied. And when you're talking about merit-based applications and 600 pages, mm -hmm. yeah, I, and then COVID. Right, and COVID really threw a lot of things off, which is, but that's how we ended up here, honestly. Uh, without COVID, there would be no 420 experience. So, I mean, I, I look at the, the silver lining, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, somebody in the chat asked um, if you were partnering with any social equity applicants in Michigan. I don't, does Michigan have a social equity pro? I don't think they have a full blown program. They're working on it. And I know the city of Detroit is definitely working on it. You'll have, I don't know if Shanita's already been on today or she's coming. Yeah, Shanita tomorrow. was on earlier in the licensing panel, which was awesome. Anyone who was there, definitely share how that was. But if not, you can check it in the replay later. And I know that Shanita is, um, you know, working with policymakers in and around Detroit and state legislators around social equity policy. So I think it's coming. Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. What about Georgia? So we know some stuff's going on with Georgia. Are you following Georgia right now? A little bit. I mean, um, you know, we know on the medical side what's happening. And and right. uh, so, you know, it'll loosen up, and the, you know, eventually. It's right. going to be very interesting to see how it all plays out. You know, thankfully, um, and hopefully, you know, uh, yeah, in DeKalb County and in Fulton County and in the city of Atlanta, you've got policymakers who will ensure um, that the right folks get the opportunity to do business. Yeah. Um, but you know, you, you may have an issue at the state house. Let's we'll have to see how it goes. So I think you know, like looking at how the medical program is right now in Georgia, there's going to be, I believe, seven or so licenses, five to seven. Yeah. Um, and all of those licenses will be vertically integrated and they will be able to open up multiple retail locations. So they're creating, you know, small the like, model. Yeah. Mm -hmm, these conglomerates and all this stuff. They're going to go to big ones. So I think that, you know, that's going to have Georgia at the end of the day, as progressive as it, the city of Atlanta is. It's still a red state. So I think that you're going to see them do that. But then as we get into the adult use conversation and then expanding medical, like you said, I think that, you know, the leaders coming out of Atlanta um, that really have a voice could could really push that conversation and shift it to be focused more on social equity, because I think that's the way that you expand um, access you know, through pushing the conversation to social equity and the injustices on the war on drugs. If you push it to that, then how it's almost like, you know, when you, you can't ignore something so egregious, you can't ignore what has happened to these communities. But if we're just talking about, you know, oh, black people deserve to get a license, that's not as compelling. We have to tell the story the right way. Yeah, I agree. Especially I, we can leverage what we're experiencing now, right? Like there's a lot of conversation around health equity. Right. Right. And so there is, um, um, again, like I think every time that we talk about cannabis intensely or talking about cannabis per se, mm -hmm. um, it only serves us in our own circle. Right. Like, a few policymakers who are advocates who really get it. But mm -hmm. when we talk about self-determination, right. when we talk about self-determination and um, equality, um, and leveraging capitalism, mm -hmm. right, which is yeah. like the American dream in order right. to do it. And then we can look at building wealth. Yeah. And then you and then you can go back and look at arrest and look at, you know, unfairness and say, all right, you know, this is not 
let's not let's not go down some controversial conversation about quote unquote reparations. Let's just talk about capitalism and providing an opportunity for us to leverage to improve our own outcomes that then benefits all of society. Mm -hmm. I 100 percent agree. It's all about it's almost like reversing um, just it, it reversing this systematic oppression that has been uh, you know drilled into our brains and now giving us a new outlook on how we can uh, build wealth for our families and it's going to in turn help the American economy as a whole. Yeah, and I mean even when you go to Atlanta like when you're yeah. in Virginia or South Carolina like and you're in the Bible Belt, we have our own cultural issues with respect to cannabis, right? And mm -hmm. um, you know I mean, you went to school there. I went to school there. Everybody was was, was consuming. But right. When, when, you talk about, when you talk about policymakers and where the vote comes out of the church, you 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 know, you may have some uh, different points of view. And so we have to know how to frame the conversation in a way that includes everybody that accomplishes what we want to accomplish. I agree. I agree. So does anyone, anyone in the chat, are you in states that are, you know, talking right now about social equity? I want to hear about, um, you know, how you, what questions you have about engaging with your state legislators. And Kareem, can you kind of talk about how you suggest people to engage in the conversation about social equity with their state legislators? Because that's where it kind of starts. Yeah, it does. But I, I just wanted to say that engaging with policymakers is engaging with human beings, right? And when you go yeah. with your hand out first, um, it's like any other relationship. Yeah. Especially from folks who have uh, garnered votes and who deal with a lot of people who have their hand out. Yeah. Right. And so um, I think with any relationship, you start with adding value. And right. Finding out, you know, how do you, uh, what's the best way to build a relationship with that policymaker where somebody has a reason other than your singular vote to care about your point of view mm -hmm. uh, and their teams, right? Because the policymaker has, has always, staff yeah. and teams and folks that are in community doing the, the good work and you got to be consistent. So mm -hmm. when people know that you're consistent, they uh, observe your behavior um, over time, you will have access and credibility um, and, and influence. I tell, that, yeah. I tell people that a lot that, you know, when they're in the process of, you know, waiting for an application process to come out, if they're in a state where it hasn't been introduced, if they're able to build credibility by, you know, starting a business somehow in the space and, you know, just having an actual name and then engaging politically yeah. um, and really getting involved in that conversation, like you said, it helps build that credibility when it does come time um, for the actual licenses. And then, you know, also, I think another thing that builds credibility is partnering with groups like yours um, and, and being able to say, you know, I've gone through this because now you are making a name for yourself. When people see fourth movement, they're going to know, oh, that person was properly trained. Um, they understand the fundamentals of business. They also understand, you know, um, how to do you guys teach about fundraising? Not politically. No, we don't okay. teach about that. But we, we talk about community activism. Okay. And all of our folks, the, the, the 13 that we've been successful with so far and everybody else is really engaged. You know, when I see policymakers in and around LA, they're like, man, you know, I bump into your folks or, you know, your social equity partners at the grocery store or they're here or there and they and they know who now who represents them. They're engaged yeah. politically. They want to talk about their experience. They want to be yeah. helpful in other ways. They're doing things that don't have anything to do with cannabis, cleaning up streets and working with homeless right. or feeding elderly people, even through COVID because they're, they're, um, you know, fired up, like just turned on. Yeah. Like they, they, you know, sometimes you have to demonstrate how you can, you really have the power to make change in your life and in your community and with your kids. And uh, yeah. somebody's never done that before. They don't, they don't, realize it. I give the analogy a lot of times, like on Crenshaw, when you get off the 10 freeway and you, and you travel south, you have to pass what's called West Angeles Church. So it's like this beautiful, big black church. On mm -hmm. I mean, it's huge. It's, it looks mm -hmm. like a dome, right? Wow. Um, it is a dome. Mm -hmm. And every time you drive by it, it's like a reminder that black people can do great things because mm -hmm. 
you're in Atlanta or DC, you don't like drive down the street and see high rises or, you know, big buildings and think, oh, a black person financed this, built this, so on. Right. Like, it doesn't seem like, oh, this this is something I could do. Right. But yeah. it's called something that we can do. Yeah. And um, when people get exposed to it, you know it for sure, right? Yeah, that's why it's so important. I mean, I that's why I wanted to talk about your experience with Buffalo Wild Wings, because you have already built something really amazing, something that uh, a lot of African-Americans haven't been able to do. I know a few African-American franchisees, um, but I mean, there's still few in that space, too. Yeah, for um, sure. I definitely wanted to highlight that. Yeah, I mean. Go to a finance conference or a, yeah. know, anywhere in corporate America is the same way, right? Mm-hmm. unless yeah. you're going to Morgan's or you know what I mean like in tech if you go to a conference if you're not going to Afrotech it ain't happening right. Right? So, <laughs> um yeah that's I mean that's 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 where it is and I got to give you know like again you know kind of winning the birth lottery my parents who both come from South LA without a lot of resources became McDonald's franchisees so I grew up yeah. in so if I didn't if I didn't know it I didn't know it was possible I didn't understand it from listening to it at the dinner table or working in those stores you know i worked at mcdonald's on the in the west end when i was at morehouse right wow mm-hmm. yeah. so um oh, that mcdonald's mm-hmm. yeah, that, <laughs> walk right past mrs winters yeah. <laughs> yeah and worked at mickey d so mm-hmm. um you you have those experiences which let me know what i could do at, at in buffalo wild wings right or a concept that i enjoy being working at you know, hey, um, and without that, I probably wouldn't have the exper- have had the experience um, to be able to do what we're doing now. So it is about experience, and we got to know that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you one last question, and then if anyone else has any questions, you can drop them in the chat. Um, did you have a moment where it was like I definitely want to pivot to the cannabis industry, and like? Was there, you know, was there a person that inspired you? Was there something that happened? I know for me, I had just gotten out of school um, and I was studying economics. So for me, it was like around 2014 when they were uh, really talking about the growth rate of the industry and all that stuff. So my brain was thinking about all the economic opportunity. And then I fell in love with the plant. And then I fell in love with the fact that I could help, uh, you know, really bring light to the social justice issue and then actually further um, help make sure that other people were included in the industry. I just fell in love with it from different aspects, but originally it was the economic opportunity for me. Um, but did you have a moment where it was like, this is, I want, I, I have to pivot here and this is why? I guess so. Yes and no. I, I will mm-hmm. tell you that I've always been like, you're a business a businesswoman. And as yep. a businesswoman, every month at the end of the month, you got to be like you close your books and you're looking at your P&L and mm-hmm. trying to figure out, OK, how do you improve your margins? Because by improving your margins, you improve profitability. Right. That's right. just what it is. Mm-hmm. As black people, I've always been about outcomes and frustrated, like, right. Mm-hmm. So the outcome P&L is outcomes and these health disparities or mm-hmm. uh, how we do uh, collectively are our outcomes. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, we've had African American policymakers in LA and in DC and in Atlanta and wherever for a long time, but our outcomes haven't improved. If anything, they've gotten mm-hmm. worse, right? So, why is that, and mm-hmm. how do we change it? Um, and uh, so, no, I mean, people had reached out to me, you know, as an entrepreneur, like, man, could you invest in this grow, or would you do this, or right. would you do that? It's like. You know, I sell chicken and beer. I'm not really interested in the <laughs> weed business. Uh, but one of our city council pe- persons here in LA called me uh, because of the philanthropic work and because I was a retail operator and just said, hey, man, are you paying attention to what we're trying to do around social equity? Mm-hmm. Uh, would you just take a look at it, see if you want to get engaged? Because um, we need like, you know, some seasoned, established people in community to get engaged. Right. right? So not like... I want to hook you up, but it was like, we know you do good work. You're a good person. And we need, you know, some folks that have some seasoning in business to get engaged. Cause that's so, oftentimes yeah. the problem, which is why your program, I'm guessing you decided to even do your program the way that you did, instead of just going out and getting your own license, yeah. 
and doing it. I mean, you saw that need for the mentorship and the actual job training. It's about outcomes for me. It's not about yeah. making money in cannabis first. It's about like how as black people do we get access to resources to then stand up the most competitive businesses in the country in, in, mm -hmm. beginning in this industry for us um, um, and keep it going. And I know that we can do that because it's black and brown people that run our restaurants that do very well or black and brown people when you go to Walmart that are primarily the general manager or black and brown, brown people when you go to Costco or black and brown people when you go to Walgreens. Right. right? Um, you know, who are operating black and brown people at the airports that are operate, you know what I mean? That are operating multi-billion dollar industry. It's not, it has nothing to do with intellect. It has to do with mindset yeah. and experience at that level of the game. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, let's, 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 let's go create our own uh, ecosystem of black wealth and let's mm -hmm. prepare what has to be true, right? In order to do it and then just go make it happen. I, I so agree. We have to just make it happen. That's how when I was doing, when I was going through the process, trying to figure it out, um, I definitely didn't have a lot of instruction. I didn't have, you know, someone like you helping me to navigate the process. So I had to just figure it out. But I'm really glad that I did um, because now I can reach back and do something very similar um, for people over here on the East Coast trying to navigate this process because it is I mean, it's really something. Have you guys considered, so what's the long-term trajectory? I don't know if you can you can spill all the juice yet, but what's the long-term, let's say, five-year look for, five and then 10-year look for fourth movement? And then, um, and then I'll ask you a second follow-up question after that. Sure. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's learned that you always got to have these, like, outsized goals. You know, yeah. you got to be focused on what you got to do today in order to be effective today and you can't get out, you know, um, over your skis, mm -hmm. right. Or the whole thing can, can crumble, but you do right. have to begin with the end in mind. And so, you know, to me, like, can it, you know, um, I have a lot of respect for cannabis, a tremendous amount of respect for it. And that's where we are to start, but it's, yeah. it's really to leverage the same model to do other businesses outside of cannabis. So where 64 and hope is, one of the brands that fourth movement does, but we could, you know, be in the restaurant space or we could be in the dry cleaning space or we could do whatever it's about. To me, it's about black ownership and how much of it can we help create? I love that. I mm -hmm. love that. Okay. So in 10 years, fourth movement could be taking a, a, a whole portfolio of brands from different industries, maybe public. Something like that. We'll Something see. Like that. Okay. We'll maybe, see. maybe. Yeah. Um, and then um, what is your, I want to ask the last panel this too, or maybe it was earlier, I asked someone this, what do you believe is uh, going to be the outlook of cannabis? What will cannabis look like in 10 years? Well, you know, God willing, we get a new president. I think if we get a new president, um, you know, at the end of this year, I think probably within two years after that, we'll have federal legalization. That'll change a lot. I think if we get a new president and assuming that in, you know, in these next two years, mm -hmm. the Congress stays the same, at least on the House of Representatives side and you know, maybe the Senate too. But then I, if, if even on the House side, we'll probably get something that looks like um, some social equity, federal social equity legislation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you'll be a part of that conversation. Maybe so. I know you will. Yeah, yeah, I will. I will. And I'll tag you in whenever I can. I got you. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah, that, you know, so, so, so that's what I think. And then cannabis is going, going to continue to become more and more ubiquitous. I think we can look to the legacy states or the states that have, um, you know, been in the adult use space the longest, like Colorado, and you see what percentage of the population and how many people um you know per dispensary how much cannabis is consumed and that just kind of lets you know you know in a market that's eight years old what that looks like mm -hmm. and the rest of the country you know is going to go there i think the tax revenue i think covid if anything is only going to accelerate the desire the same uh, thing. yeah because now all of a sudden we're essential right so how can we be essential yet we can't you know you don't treat us like a regular business yet you expect us to stay open 
you know, my employees are putting themselves um, at risk. And I'm saying expect us to stay open. Like I'm not extremely grateful that we are open right now. I am. Um, But still, you know, I just think I agree that it completely helps to accelerate the conversation. So COVID is in all in all, I mean, it's awful thing that's happening. It's a national, I mean, a global pandemic is awful, but it was good for cannabis on the economic side. Well, we're looking at the numbers, right? So, you know, you know, people who consume are serious about consuming. So (laughs) definitely. uh, Yeah, we know that's the case, and I don't think we're going to see less of it. We're going to see more of it. Definitely. So. Um, okay, someone asked one last question, um, and then our DJ is going to join us back on stage. But Don C. asks if we could speak to the process of forming a cooperative. Um, so you kind of mentioned the difference of like uh, what a cooperative is and what you're doing, but go ahead. Um, yeah, so I'd be careful about talking about how to form it because it's a legal entity. So I'd always say, you know, um, uh, refer to an attorney in whatever state or jurisdiction that you're in with respect to what is a cooperative there because it's, yes, not, it's not, not legal advice, guy. Yeah, you can't <laughs> leverage, you know, the federal definition because it's not federally legal. Right. Right. So, yeah, the, the only way in which you've got to reference the feds is in tax policy, 280E. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, and how what you're doing, you know, interacts with that. So. Um, but generally, um, I, you know, I think it is a good uh, it's a good idea. You just got, have to have um, morally aligned people. Mm-hmm. Right. Like the benefit of being a sole proprietor is you're the boss. And if you're a good person, you don't have to worry about somebody else's weaknesses or whatever else. When you get into a co-op, you are you are inter- interdependent, and of course you can create you know um, rules and frameworks and and, and all of that. But uh, in any way possible that we can leverage each other in order to get a competitive advantage, I think we ought to do that. There are different ways to look at it, and, and a co-op certainly is one. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Okay, well, um, Kareem, do you have any last words that you'd like to give everybody? Anything you'd like to close out with? Yeah, just stay engaged, you know, stay engaged, continue to have these conversations. Um, I think the policymaker engagement is really critical. Uh, And then being in communication, communities like this um, are critical. Um, And then, and remember like that the license or the opportunity to do business um, and the revenue, the resources that you gain from this business, make it bigger than yourself. Let's go improve our outcomes and leverage this opportunity to do it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kareem. I really appreciate you taking some time out today. Have you been enjoying your quarantine? <laughs> I've been working. I've been on Zoom calls from eight in the morning till six at night. I know. Right? I said the same thing, but I'm busier yeah. now, I feel like, than I was yeah. before. Yeah, you know, like all the time in the car between locations no longer exists. It's right. like, you can get a break, <laughs> listen to loud music and all of that kind of stuff. It's, that's over. It's like one call to a next. But it's productive. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm grateful for my health and my family's health and, uh, and, and, and wish everybody else, you know, to stay safe, stay inside. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And how are you celebrating 420 tomorrow? I'm working. Yeah. <laughs> all day. <laughs> all then I'll day, be every day, right? Yeah, there you go. I know we, us entrepreneurs, we can't help it. That's it. I, I created, so I decided to do this about 15 days ago. So, you know, I just made up more work for myself. Can't help yeah. it, but all We're right, Kareem. All right, Hope. Gonna let Take you care. Go. Thank you so much. All right, bye.